you know the sensation of actually doing your fullest but with a calm mind so it's strained but it's still easy I think this is the most uh, interesting thing and both me and Santa has developed this during many years so so this is just how we train I started parkour at the um, at Galileo it's a sports academy so just as a student and quite randomly that was one of the subjects that I chose and I think after a year of, of training this I started to teach at the school just some small classes because there were, weren't a lot of teachers back then and yeah, suddenly it spread, you know, uh, to small places in Copenhagen where I was teaching and I just trained on the side. Yeah, so I've been training for 14 years. The whole attitude of training back then, like the whole parkour attitude was different than any other sport I went to or tried. Playing a lot of basketball, so it was really non-competitive. And I think in 2007, the guys that was teaching me, they went to France and got a lot of knowledge from the French guys. But in the years following, there was a lot of like, um, I have to say there was a lot of mix up of the French values and the way that the founders were training, um, with a lot of conditioning, a lot of strength training. And we kind of tried to incorporate that with some of the sports science that we have in, the, that we have in Denmark. There was a little more like didact didactics and um, the way we, was, we were teaching was also different and we tried to like incorporate everybody and I know the French guys ha had the same attitude but sometimes they were losing people because the training was too hard so we tried to find like a middle spot maybe trying to professionalize it a little more as well so it wasn't just a street sport but it could also actually you could teach it in schools and stuff like this. Back in the days, it was much more about finding your potential and being like, okay, develop as much as possible, really boosting yourself. Yeah, I'm really like boiling, boiling the pot to like to max. And then now it's much more about actually going, going into that meeting with a wholesome mind and being like, okay, I don't need the adrenaline rush. I don't need all of this necessarily. And being like, where's my weaknesses? So with age, I become much more frightened. The, no, the training is not frequent enough. Like I have another level of anxiety for this, uh, for some of the heights of some of the bigger jumps. So now it's much more about looking at those jumps again, coming back, uh, meeting that anxiety and, and being true to it. How do you think um, this practice influences your general life and what is parkour for you? Why, why so much uh, emphasis on, on, on challenge, hardship mm. and, and sometimes battling? Yeah. The reason why those are really, really important is because life in general is made up of challenges. Like you'll always meet some kind of barrier or some kind of wall in your life that's kind of obstructing your path or whatever it might be. And I think most of most people have a tendency to be like, how can I, how can I get past this huge thing in my life? And within, parkour, within the practice of parkour, you kind of, you kind of get into the mindset of like accepting a lot of these challenges and a lot of the, the hardships and you kind of start to support yourself in that practice. Um, my experience is that my level of anxiety in general is very low suddenly, whereas when I was younger it was really, really high because I know fear really well. And, and I have a sensation that it really carries over into the act of, act of helping. Because the more comments I have, the more I can give. So we try to verbalize this um, while we practice. And that actually means that when you go into your everyday life, that kind of transfers, so it carries over. That you don't, or like that I don't um, judge my emotions in the same way that I did before. So I don't judge emotions as being like happy is not necessarily positive. And and uh, sadness or sorrow is not ne necessarily negative. 
So that means everything kind of flows like this. Yeah. So it, it feels it feels more, more calm. So even though the practice is really, really intense and you know you're running or you're jumping really fast and you and, and your legs are hurting stuff like this it's actually inducing calmness on the other side um, but in this society that we're living in i think it's really really important that we prepare ourselves for hardships that we prepare our mind for um, for some of the chaos in the world and and the parkour practice and the discipline is completely drenched within this kind of um, hardship logic or chaos logic. Jumping on buildings, whatever it might be, jumping on concrete and finding challenges within this kind of urban environment will to some extent make you more, how to say, um, more resilient towards what, what comes towards you. Whereas I have a sensation that most of modern life is the opposite. It's trying to um, get you to a, a place of comfort and safety. And I don't mind comfort and safety, but nothing in life is static and nothing is permanent. That means you can't get complete safety all the time and it will in the end end. So death will be part of your life. And I think for a lot of people it sounds really hard, some like quite harsh to say it like this. But for my part, the practice of the discipline of parkour is is uh, is preparing myself for that. But all this emotional capacity and all this emotional uh, intelligence is for most people and in modern life is neglected so we forget to actually engage in it then sometimes it comes rolling you know like a tidal wave like suddenly we're, we're totally flushed with the with emotions and we can't stay with it we don't know what it is whereas in the practice of parkour you'll you'll see fear every day and you'll engage in it like very wholeheartedly you'll be like okay there's fear right here let's look at it there's pain right here, let's look at it. And I think it's important because you can do this in any way. But I like the manifestation. I like the way that it's so practical that it's like fear is, is right in, in this moment from you jumping from here to there. That's it. So jumping despite of fear, engaging despite of fear and seeing that this is about life and accepting it and still acting. I think this is one of the ways that it actually stabilizes in the brain. And, and it doesn't mean that fear goes away. I think a lot of people have this, oh, then you become emotionless and you can't suddenly feel anything. Yeah, like the, like the Iron Man, you know, and you'll just be like some kind of a shield walking around, not feeling, but it actually is the opposite. So you'll become much more tolerant towards your feelings and you'll let them flow because you're not afraid of them. So there's no letting, letting um, you're not putting a lid on it. If I get afraid, I get afraid, yeah. So it's very basic. And being honest towards that, it's like, okay, do you do the job or don't you? So what would you say to someone who never practiced parkour and would be interested but afraid? I think for someone who never tried it before, who had this like curiosity, um, I definitely try to understand that it's not about um, comparison or like um, that you don't have to achieve anything within the practice. So the fear, is, like the fear of, for example, getting hurt, that's very um, normal. And I think that's one of the parts that we are progressively working towards uh, diminishing. Um, but most people don't fear this uh, the most. Most people fear the most to be, to not be good enough. They are basically uh, afraid of failures. So I'd spend a lot of time on explaining how the discipline um, 
works with failures. That means like it's failures are something that we try to be better at. So the practice in itself is actually um, more about learning how to fail than it is um, learning how to do the right thing. mentality and you go like okay so I'm actually practicing being bad at it and I, my hands were perfect perfect witness <laughs> then suddenly you take a lot of pressure off yourself you the spinning because then this is one of the main points this is one of the purposes and then if you fail you're like oh but this is one this is what I'm practicing so it's okay this is how I get better at it right so I'll try to explain this um, most people don't get it <laughs> because because they have a mindset that, you know, it's about perfection. And we'll try to work against that within the practice and be like, yeah, you can do it whatever you like. It can look differently because you're a different person, right? So the jump is the jump, but the way you do the jump is not the same way as I do it. And if you can't go all the way and you fail, then we practice failing. So all parts all, like all things within the, the discipline is practicing that thing specifically because all of them are testimonials of life. But knowing truly that nothing has perfection, I think from, from my part, it comes a lot from the Zen Buddhism, which is Buddhism in general, which is much more about being in tune with nature and how nature works like how biology works basically and if you look at a tree it's not really like when can some of us say that a tree is perfect because it's so complex and so diverse in the way that it grows why do they structure themselves like this creepy and it's the same with us so but we don't see it this way so we make up some kind of hierarchy of what is good and what is not good um, and then creates this illusion of, of, of perfection but if we look closely towards how the world is structured then everything is imperfect everything is different like nothing is the same and that knowledge in itself is perfection so so that influenced me a lot in my own practice because it it gave me a lot of um, how to say this it gave me a lot of um, empathy and compassion towards myself and towards my imperfections Ooh, i'm a little scared look <laughs> you're allowed to it's fine Can you tell us a bit more about your other practices? So you're also drawing, uh, mm. you have an education as uh, sports science in physiotherapy, mm. and, uh, and you like tea. So the tea culture, the tea is basically just a way to practice some kind of meditation while actually doing. And same with drawing, that's why I started to draw. Um, so I think it's always like this, you need to find the mental purpose of your practice and not the other way around. So if, I think for most people it would be the reason why they, for example, uh, made a tea would be to drink a tea, drink a cup of tea, a nice one, right? So for me, it's the other way around. So I make a cup of tea in order to practice my mind, cultivate uh, my mind um, in a calm way or like um, making more awareness and then I get a cup of tea. So I think that's the, so my main purpose for every, is the same with the drawing. The drawing is about details, it's about nuances, and it's about me trying to f narrow my focus in on something very specific in front of me. Um, and then I kind of try to draw or write, same thing. And then in the end, I get a drawing or maybe I get a poem. But it's always um, trying to kind of channel your inner landscape out into the world and then always trying to cultivate that kind of um, uh, that connection 
and the parkour practice is just really it's like one of the more intense practices like tea ceremony is really delicate de -de 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 -de, small things you know the parkour practice is much more um, open and like big and it's and it's really full of sensory inputs so this is like maybe some maybe you can actually call it the it's like the poles so if you have the tea ceremony it's like the calm way of doing it and practicing like calmness and loneliness stuff like this whereas the parkour practice is much more about uh, practicing the hardships and the chaos but basically it's the same mind that should be in both situations and for your parkour teaching how do you implement on a practical uh, level um, this work on the mind uh, instead of the movement mm. it's very difficult I think I, I try to I try to verbalize it to my students a lot so when I when I make um, so I do the same thing as I did as I told you with the tea practice and stuff okay? so I have a mind focus first so if my mind focus would be for teaching um, to stay with stillness or silence I try to make up small drills that will um, emphasize that. Yeah. Obviously, don't talk. That would be maybe a thing. But trying to be silent in their movements, you know. So I'll try to then narrow in what, what's the main thing and then say the focus for this uh, drill is this. That means maybe if we're jumping, so the uh, focus will be on soft landings or silent landings. So we work on this. And then maybe another day, it's the same jump, but I change the focus. I verbalize another focus. So today the focus is about uh, the takeoff or blah, blah, whatever it might be. And I think this is the most, um, it's the most important part that you actually try to give your students a purpose with the drill. That's more than the drill itself. You want me to heal it? Oh, we have our hands, you know? With a lot of openness, because you can determine what kind of experience people get, but you can uh, facilitate that they will experience themselves. So it's a team sport, it's a team effort, but it's only a team effort in this sense that you are supported by somebody else in your own practice. You have to do all the work yourself, but somebody is there, is there to support you uh, along the way and you spend your energy on supporting them as well. I think for some people, they would like somebody to strive and to push them, like do more, like do more so you can get, like do the bigger jumps. But for us, it's much more about supporting like what we are trying to, to develop this mind thing. Movements, they just feel very nice, like they're so fluent, but if they have like this kind of medium uh, distance, so if it's, not too, if it's not too high, if it's not too small, but then it just feels perfect. So we have different uh, strategies in order to overcome challenges because we have to use different um, like biomechanical uh, like advantages, right? So that means he will have an emphasis on some kind of uh, movements and that's not my uh, priorities because it's not, my, it's not what I'm best at. Jumping, um, long jumps, drops. I like drops actually. But you know, uh, but he's a long jumper. He's really good with this high tension in his legs. And I'm not. I don't jump very far. And this is really, really difficult because sometimes he will push jumps in. He's like, let's do this jump. I'm like, that's really far. But still, like we engage in this together, and what I think is the most interesting thing is that we always do the same thing, but we do them differently, because we have to, like oh, it's diff it's difficult to say differently because it looks exactly the same for most people. But when we look at it together, me and him, I can see that his uh, reaction time is faster. Maybe I'm curling up more in order to get my legs through, and he's just jumping higher. There's like small subtleties in how we do it but we try to overcome the same thing in the same way. 
So that means we are pushing each other in like in, in, in two different directions where we would normally not go. That means now that we have like almost just the same practice because we've been using this for so long. So it's the same things that we like now because I've been pushed in one direction. He's been pushed in another direction. And then we meet in the middle. We laugh a lot when we train and we think it's funny. And we, none of us is afraid of failing in the eyes of each other. And there's no comparison. When he didn't have time, I trained way less. When he had more time, I started having a lot more motivation. Because training with him is just more fun. Just need with a with a cortisol injection. Ready, <laughs> before you start. Ready. Can I get some cortisol? <laughs>